Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sir Brania. I will be your host. I will be talking to these two poets, Nora Gomringer and Marie de Quatre Barbe. And um, let me talk about the process first a little bit. Uh, I thought it would be nice if the poets would read each other's work and pick three poems of each other to talk about. So that's the basic plan. Uh, the program will be in English. Um, the translations of the text they will be reading are in your possession, I believe. If you don't have any, just please say so. They're English or uh, French translations, and you can find them here. Oh, that's the last one. So uh, the otherwise, you will have to shack up with somebody and share and cuddle and be close to the translations together. Poetry unites, Poetry unites indeed. Um, so let me introduce the two poets first, and then we'll uh, get going. Nora Gomringer, born in 1980 to German and Swiss parents, is acclaimed for her alternatively playful and piercing poetry as well as her lively performances. Gomringer, who originally tra trained as a dancer, first made her mark in Germany's emerging slam scene. Is it true? I love it. Um, I saw, oh, well, let's start. With kind this. of. Interesting. Kind of. Yeah, let's okay, let me, let me about that later. Gomringer, who originally kind of trained as a dancer. <laughs> First made her mark in Germany's emerging slam scene, kind of, hoping. In 2001, she co-founded the regular slam event in Bamberg, let me check this, where she has lived since 1996. Gumringer's background in performance remains tantamount to her practice. Musicality and evocation of voice and character are key to her poetry, and her collections are often accompanied by audio recordings. There's a richness to both her work and readings that was very well caught in a quote I found online. Nora Gomringer's Gedichte fragen nicht lange, stehen einfach da, bringen Kuchen mit, ohne eingeladen zu sein. Nora Gomringer's poems don't take long, are simply there and bring cake without having been invited. Gomringer's earlier collections explore common poetic motifs from unexpected perspectives and are as notable for their silences as their content. With love poems, for example, which rarely askew any mention of heartache. While these poems often deal with personal and lyrical topics, the best known among them include poems reflecting on the Holocaust, as well as satires of the literary industry. Her most recent collection, Monster Poems, Morbus, and Mode, form a trilogy of surfaces and invisibilities, and mark a new phase in her poetics. The collections resolve or revolve around horror, illness, and fashion, respectively, with each poem exploring a facet of the collection's theme, from a rhythmical herpes waltz in Morbus to an almost visual representation of a haunted house in monster poems. The content tends to determine the poem's form, and the texts are more condensed than her earlier work, occasionally tending towards minimalism. Thank you. Was that about right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very honored. Some of the most striking aspects of French poet Marie de Quatre Barbe's poems are her resolutely experimental approach, her tendency towards estrangement, and her powerfully developed use of form. Those characteristics might be related to her studies at several Paris art schools, but in any case, her poetry bears both traces of Gilles Deleuze's theory and Marcel Duchamp's art, of fairy tales and nursery rhymes, of the language of women's magazines and internet speech. In her first collections, the poet uses a disruptive poetics, causing the autobiographical tale beneath to only occasionally surface. Series of free verses from which a story emerges just briefly about a solitary childhood, a turbulent romance. This does not mean that those narrative snippets are written in the first person. However, the subject changes constantly. You never know who is speaking, whether the text is actually a mesh of quotations, whether it is mocking or self-mocking, or just how many double meanings lie in wait. In her most recent collection, Gommage de Tête, a title inspired by David Lynch's Eraserhead, and we'll come back to that later, that autobiographical subtext has disappeared, and the poet starts to explore forms that are less fragmented, more like prose, minimalist storylines, snippets of dreams and folk tales. Thus far, she has published four collections of poems, which are collections of memories and desires, stereotypes and cliches, word games and sound effects, nonsense and humor liberated spaces within which anything goes. 
Welcome to Thanks. this poetry talk. Um, so let's start with the first poem. And that's uh, Nora's poem, and you, were, you asked for and it was a day and a day was ending. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for the selection. <clears throat> Does everybody have it in front of them? It's the first page. Und es war ein Tag und der Tag neigte sich. Und es war Stehen und es war Warten und es war eine Masse und es sah aus wie ein Meer. Und es waren Männer und es waren Frauen und es waren Kinder und es roch nach Leder. Und es waren Koffer und es war Dampfen und es waren Münder und es war das Wort. Und es war Stumpfes und es war Taubes und es waren Große und es waren Mäntel und es waren Hunde und es war Wimmern und es war Weinen und es war Einzug und es waren Waggons und es war eine Rampe und es war Eile und es hieß hinein und es war Drängen und es war wieder Eile und es war Härte und es war der Ton. Und es waren Hände und es waren Blicke und es waren Minuten und es war Enge und es war kein Raum und es war bald Nacht und es war ein Scherz. Denn sie waren wie Rinder und es war ein Riegel und es war ein Ruck. Und es war Fahren und es war keine Luft. Und es war Nacht und es war Zeit und es war zu lang. Und es war Flüstern und es war Raunen und es war Mutmaßen und es waren Fragen und es war Hitze und es war zu eng. Und es war wieder Weinen und es war ein Eimer und es waren vier Ecken und es war ein Geruch und es war eine Scham. Und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden. Und es war Durst und es war Wirre und es war Sinken und es war Lehnen. Und es war ein müdes Gebet und es war trübes Wasser aus der Kelle und es war ein Ruck. Und es war ein Lauschen und es war eine Hoffnung und es war eine Sprache und es war ein Land. Und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden und es waren Stunden. Und es waren Ahnungen und es waren Gerüchte und es war ein Feuer, das lief. Und es waren Fetzen und es waren Worte und es war sicher nicht wahr. Und es war ein Ruck und es war wahr und es war ein seltsamer Name. Au, schw, itz. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Nora. Um, actually, um, I asked you if you could read this poem because um, I discovered it on the website, on the poetry festival website, and it, I, it's a very strong poem. And um, I, I'm just discovering your work and. I can see that there are a lot of different things inside your work, and it's a, a lot of heterogeneity in a very positive way, and uh, I'm very sensitive to that. And um, th this poem in particular, um, I, I, it's written in a very direct language, and uh, I wanted to hear how it, is, how it sounds when, I mean, it's very uh, strong when you read it with, all, with the, the, the repetitions, the anaphora, and the way uh, the sentences, the lines uh, start and like a propulsion, something very physical. And um, maybe my que question could be how how it works. I mean, how you how did you write it? This this poem in particular, and maybe others. Um, this text is in the middle of a text trias. So at first there is one text that is very intimate. It's called monologue. Then comes this piece, uh, which is also for the speaker, whoever speaks it. It's, I've not written it for myself, and uh, the um, enunciation via my body and presence. Um, and then the third one is one that is uh, more political and says and states, um, I'm not sure if I would have been the one staying apart from this movement. I, I cannot vouch for myself for so many reasons. And um, this second piece I wanted to construct uh, alongside the Torah and the sound of the Torah. And uh, when you read the Torah, of course, it has the same, it's this uh, endless enumeration of who begets or what begets what, who comes from where. Who, um, uh, it's an endless chain of and, 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 and this comes after this and he comes after that. And I find it so so soothing on the one hand, and that's also why um, 
I hope people also read the Torah and read um, the Old Testament because there are forms in it that are actually soothing when you read them, um, no, no matter the content. <laughs> um, but the form itself um, has power, and there is, um, I would think it would uh, also serve as a, almost a magical um, rhythm in it. But of course here I, um, I employ this magic to then give an idea of how a word comes to life. This is the genesis of the word Auschwitz, which is now the synonym for the Holocaust itself. Whereas when you think of it, of course, someone, for the first time, every one of us has mm. at some point had to speak and say this word. So I, that's why I used it um, to, to make the, the, the moment of language acquisition quite visible. Right. That's how we, we learn language. We repeat, we learn, and then we voice a word in syllables. We say, oh, sh and um, I've, I've, I've been doing studies on how the, the camps themselves, the concentration camps, served as language and, um, yeah, language uh, ca cattles almost. I mean, there, there were so many languages uh, meeting in there and mm. so many people from different uh, backgrounds, of course. So that's... Yeah, I use this. This piece uh, wants to show how language is um, is actually also there to expose ourselves and how we come into being. So sometimes I use this because it's also on the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, stage language has to serve very different purposes than just language that is meeting the eye uh, in the beginning, and um, so. Uh, repetition helps in everything. Mm. And this, of course, is highly manipulative. I, I write a lot with uh, a strategy to manipulate and to get um, So it almost uses a, a propaganda across. technique. In a way, yeah. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, yes. Thanks. Um, there's, uh, you said something uh, about the magical, and I, uh, I was uh, watching a no number of short interviews with you on YouTube, and there you also said that you feel connected to the like the magical origin of poetry. Yeah, I guess everyone who's dealing with poetry on this or the ritualistic spoken, maybe spoken level, yeah. then of course you realize where does it all come from? It comes from the idea that uh, poetry is supposed to evoke either the spirits out of the earth or uh, right. the spirits out of the heavens. And so, and, um, and uh, then one can also ask whether liturgical language isn't also very magical in mm -hmm, many mm -hmm. ways and senses. And I, I enjoy going to church, and I like to listen to this uh, repetition every Sunday. And uh, it calms me, and it gives me a, uh, a strategy to deal with life. And I also mm -hmm. go to, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a go in between between different um, uh, creeds as well. So, yeah, I, the magical is, of course, of interest because um, when you nowadays cannot talk about the spiritual and the religious anymore, you can still talk about the magical. Right. With everyone, pretty much. Because yeah. everyone is very, very much wanting wonders, but no one, um, yeah, no one wants the background that was at least historically linked to wonders. Of course, they come from... But in the Netherlands, yeah, we are kind of coming back to it. I think that it's it's, yeah, it's okay you, again to write about, about the religious stuff. Yes. Yeah, like so like Joost Baars or Willem Jan Otten. There are several uh -huh. poets who are not afraid to discuss or philosophize about religion. Mm -hmm. But um, I wanted to ask you: How is this for you? Like the, the magical or, or the religious part, religious language? Does that influence your work or your way of working? Yes, I guess I'm quite sensitive to it and to the text. I mean, I have I have no um, religious background. I have been raised in a atheist family, but um, I have I am very <coughs> interested actually in the question of how God can sometimes invite Himself inside a poem, and that's actually something very strange in France because. There are some Catholic poets, for instance, but they are like very maybe marginal or very in a spe special space and not really inside the common field of poetry. And uh, for instance, I was I, I have a little journal and uh, in this poetry jo journal we translate a lot of uh, 
of uh, different languages, and uh, it's also a way to to discover a new, I mean, new authors and from uh, elsewhere than France. And uh, I was very interested, for instance, um, in the way how some Norwegian uh, poets, uh, contemporary ones, are very, you know, um, deeply um, uh, worked by the, the religious texts. Mm -hmm. And they have, I mean, they, they have a, a, a very close relationship, sorry, relationship to the text since they, they are very little, and uh, it's uh, it's inside the poem, and it's not necessarily something about face. It's something more about uh, the question, the creation, and uh, also uh, the question of the, the nature and how uh, the biological, I don't know, backgrounds and a lot of uh, issues uh, that are very also. Um, important nowadays with the climate change and so on, and how sometimes the some texts uh, very, I mean, very uh, mm -hmm. this kind of text can maybe mm -hmm. help us uh, to understand what maybe it's happening and well. Mm. Mm. I, it always seems to me as if eco poetics of the 70s and mm -hmm. 80s kind of shift into a more semantically connected right. to a. Th the, some slightly theological idea. So it must be nature plus something. So yeah, you know, plus exactly. X factor, and the X factor is either God or <laughs> some some shamanistic uh, approach. Yeah, could be. And you mm. said something about climate change. Um, and this poem is kind of well topical, or at least it, it refers to this to history. And on the, during the talk this week about conceptual poetry. Um, the, the Canadian poet said it was so weird that there's no poems, or he couldn't find a poem about uh, the landing on the moon. Um, and, and he said poetry should be, uh, yeah. we should, uh, poets should tell the story of their time mm -hmm. and their culture. But I, I was mm -hmm. wondering okay. how you look at this. Do, do, does the poet have an obligation towards the actual topical or the actuality or? The, well, the landing on the moon would be, yeah, <laughs> since we were both uh, born in the 80s, <laughs> it's a bit of a landing on Mars and hoping to land on Mars sometime might be interesting. I, in fact, pick up certain topics and vibrations that are going on mm -hmm. um, sometimes. Um, yeah, so it, it does exist. The now exists in my poetry, I could right. say that. Is it the same with you? Yes, sure, but there, maybe there is something about, you know, how we are very, um, there are so many information and so on, and uh, some sort of a media uh, pressure uh, mm. on uh, everybody, mm. and how also I think the poem uh, is a place where you can not have opinions, for instance. I mean, it doesn't mean there is no political uh, uh, question. I mean, it's deeply political, a poem, more than maybe anything. <laughs> but something like mm. uh, the opinion. I mean, I have been studying philosophy, and the first, uh, first thing I, I, I've, uh, I think uh, I've been said by my teacher when I was like, I don't know, 17 is, OK, there is uh, the philosophy, and it's like destroying your opinions on something to create something else trying to create something else. And maybe the poem is a place like that f to me. And uh, so, I mean, it's very, uh, yes, yeah, sure, uh, everything can go inside the poem and inhabit the poem, but mm, maybe not an opinion to me. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, Germans are always preoccupied with that question, especially literature critics, you know, how political is the poem? How political is the writing in general? And then you are being criticized for being too political or too little po political. So, and what about the opinion, about being opinionated? Well, I don't even think that's that? an option. They really want it to be outspokenly political. I don't think they hmm. really see it as a, as a big difference. Of course, if you state that you are pro-abortion or against abortion, right. all of that, if that uh, appears in poetry, then they would assume it shows something, whether you are leaning towards the left or the right or mm. something like that. Yeah, and that is, right now, it's very important because, of course, me going about in schools and speaking and reading these texts out loud, and in fact, this is a piece that has been in school books for 10 years now, it, so the students actually come up to me and they ask me about this right. text, so I realize... Um, it hasn't really done a lot because... Mm. <laughs> um, 
one wonders on of the purpose of literature. Can it really do something? Can it change something? And I think this is the expect, expectation that lies behind this question whether something is political or not. Right. Is it is it motivated to change something? Does this text want something of the mm. readership? And I, I can frankly say that I always want something of the readership. And I think there's a big difference sometimes yeah. because poets, sometimes they don't want that. They just want the text to speak. Right. I'm sorry, how, so how, how's that for you? For you, Do you want to change something <laughs> when, with your poems? Or what, what would you like to happen in the reader's mind? Well, um, I mean, I was talking about the opinion. Surely I, I have the feeling that I, I, I defend some mm -hmm. things, but what I defend is, is maybe a place for ambiguity and paradox and, some, mm -hmm. and s somehow make maybe people go deeper sometimes, mm -hmm. and mostly like teenagers. I, I think teenagers, you know, they are just living in this kind of world with a lot of ambiguity and uh, something quite complex. And uh, sometimes, I mean, people sometimes say my poetry is a bit difficult, but not the teenagers, so mm. I guess. Mm. <laughs> and, mm. well, something like that. The Maybe we should have uh, an example of one yes. of those poems. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm keeping, I'm looking at the no, time, good. so yeah, 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 I'm sure. trying to... So, it, yes, I, so this I, is the second poem. Exactly. While putting things away, some things away, I'm sorry, that was my wish yeah. <laughs> poem <laughs> in the first position here. So it's a, a, a long poem with uh, different sequences, and the title is Clint Eastwood, and Clint Eastwood is not exactly, <laughs> you know, very, the most, uh, well, no, I don't share his opinions, but is the title of my poem. En rangeant des affaires, j'ai reconnu le regard de son chien dans celui de Clint Eastwood. C'était une tasse en porcelaine japonaise découpée, dans la tasse japonaise qui... Les enfants furent les premiers. Ensuite, il y eut une perruche à laquelle elle disait « Il est tard, rentre chez toi ». Elle avait peur quand j'étais seule et que la nuit tombait. Le mois qui précède, elle se souvient que je l'ai appelée un soir dans le parc désert. Les lumières clignotaient, mais j'étais ivre. Lorsque s'effondre le meuble dans lequel elle range les tasses japonaises offertes par « Mémé », Précieusement, je conserve les larmes ou je les imagine. I find the intimacy striking that you can evoke. Mm. And I read this with um, I read this on a market square where so many people were loud and obnoxiously about me wanted to sell me drugs. And I said, "No, no, <laughs> keep away. I'm in inside a poem right now." And um, I was very amazed at how the, the fragility seems to be um, where I'm almost, uh, in, in German we say plakatif, you know, I uh, almost, uh, yeah, too, too out there. <laughs> um, this becomes, from, from one observation, this moves on to the next one, and it is so delicate. And it's also linked, I think this is how memory works in many ways in your poems, that it's often linked to... Um, uh, certain objects. Also, you started the first evening here with um, the beautiful analogy that, um, what was it, the poem is also seems to be linked to um, a Russian doll, um, inside and inside. So um, the, the deeper you go, the, the more to the core you get. And this also seems uh, a poem that follows this. Are you, do you write poems also to remember? Or does, do the poems come from remembrance? That's a very beautiful question. Um, you would not have expected that from no, me. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> give me that. Okay. It's just, all, the question is almost enough, but maybe I will try to, <laughs> to answer. Um, yes, may, yeah, maybe it's, uh, I mean, there is this sort of uh, ambiguity. I mean, the, the souvenir inside the, inside the poem is like a uh, declencher, you know, like uh, a match something like that, and then you can take it and it, it can go where you want, you can change it a little bit, I mean, he, he's, he's, uh, he changed yet, he's, um, he has his own, uh, I mean, autonomy, and, uh, but it's also a way to maybe, yeah, 
uh, possibly make it alive again and again and see how mm -hmm. it it lives uh, it can live another life maybe like you know um, uh, in uh, re reincarnation mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe of the of someone you you lost or or yes an image or a childhood <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, childhood is is often um, present in my poems and it's not really like you know I love children and so on and I, I do but. Children are very frightening to me. I don't know how to talk to them and so on. But, but uh, there is something like something we share, something in common is the fact we have been these kind of strange people, you call mm -hmm. children, and uh, maybe it's uh, we useful to to remember that, also. And maybe the poem is a place to remember that. Mm -hmm. So the poem becomes itself the place of remembrance. Okay, so it becomes a memory piece in a way that moves through the ages because of course in 10 years and 20 years people might read this poem and it still holds, I'm sure, because there are so many almost archetypal um, ideas and uh, in 20 years we still have cups probably, right? And mm -hmm. we still have um, older ladies that uh, lead households where a parakeet sits somewhere and there's a dog with a Clint Eastwood <laughs> expression, which is a lovely, lovely term. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, it's also within a moment. lifetime. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I don't think a lot about, you know, after my death and so on. <laughs> Maybe in a, in a few years I will think about, well, what's going on after? But for the moment, I'm just thinking about what I can keep when, you know, I'm just a person with some souvenirs and what can I do with that and how can I sometimes like put some strokes, some, uh, not strokes, rocks, <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, rocks uh, like a little path, and uh, yeah, but maybe someone uh, will follow the path, yeah. and yeah, maybe. I find that a, a wonderful um, image because that's exactly how I sometimes wish for a reader to express interest. Um, in German, it's um, we, we say, um, "Ich wünsche mir, dass er mir auf die Spur liest." I wish mm. him to read my trace mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that I'm trying to place out with this poem or the the, the small stones I put in this mm. poem. So it's very much like following the Hensel and Gretel path, you know, not necessarily to the witch's house, but mm. into something deeper. That is um, maybe back uh, home. What was that? Back home. Back home. Ah, you don't want to go visit my home, so I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, inside the poem. Come with me inside this poem and um, please on your way make sure that you don't miss those rocks because the rocks themselves are placed in a very distinctive way. Mm. And um, I, I see that here because you... you um, how is that? How, how do you explore a verse? First came the kids, then there was a parakeet, she was telling, it's late, go home. It is so, it, it, it almost seems so effortlessly, effortlessly strewn out, like, you know, there, to the birds, these, these rocks maybe. And I find this um, uh, so elegant. To me, it seems very French. <laughs> but is it very different uh, from your way of writing? I think from it the is. Way you start? Also, my poems would look very different. They have an outward look that is always packed. Right. I do not leave air between the mm. the, the verses, hardly ever. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, that might be an interesting question as well. Why? Yeah, the look of, of the, the look. poem, yes, yeah. mm. of course. What makes you decide to go for this look? So, so there's a lot of white in between the lines. Uh, it's very difficult to me because uh, it's uh, like, uh, I don't know, I, like an equation I, I cannot resolve. Because uh, in a way, I, 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 I don't know about you, but I, I don't feel like I'm writing poems. It's like, the, sorry, it's just like there is maybe, yes, uh, something, a verse, an image, and then I try to make it appear a bit more and uh, it can make another line and another line and another line and sometimes I need to put some hair between those lines because yes we need some hair sometimes and uh, that's all and uh, and it can be and some at some point it stops and well it's I don't know yeah the poem is finished and it can be on several pages and sometimes I I'm I don't know what to do because it could be just one long 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 poem mm. and uh, I, I could also go f to a page to another pages like you know to let's uh, reader 
uh, you know, uh, respire and uh, to, take to a, yeah, take a break. Yeah, to breathe. Yeah, to is, is it there mm -hmm. to yet yeah, to, to mm -hmm. also determine kind of the 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 um, speed of reading? So to slow down yeah. the reader and to make them think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I'm I, I I can look quite fast in my poem. It's like you know a stream, but uh, I like to. Maybe it's important that I go like I, sl I slow down mm. just to for the reader to be able to grab something and or, or the listener and uh, it can be also uh, important to have yet yeah, to, to have some hair to to mm. to inhabit but I also like very much the density uh, of your of your poems such like yeah like rocks and like something you that can be like you know um, um, some ballistic <laughs> experience. Mm. Mm. <laughs> ah, yeah. Or maybe I'm putting out boulders and you have to climb over them <laughs> while you just put delicate rocks on this way. It's interesting. When I hear you say this and describe this process of writing, then it seems you enjoy it. I do not enjoy writing. I've been a poet in crisis uh, the moment I began writing. And I've always seen this, this, this reading in front of people as a highly invasive act. Um, and of course, it all seems as if you come here on your own behalf and on your on your free terms. But um, simply the act of uh, lending one's ear to someone who then simply, you know, I could take you hostage now in in a certain way. I mean, everyone who gets a microphone that we see this with politicians um, can can keep the air hostage in a way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I. I've always been thinking about audience and the experience of the audience and how they, how they see all this and how they see all the fragilities uh, exposed in the light. And um, yeah, therefore, yeah, of course, then people could say, well, then stop writing and do something nice that you enjoy. But, <laughs> but when you're performing, it looks like you're having a good yeah, time. Yeah, performance is something it's I different. feel very uh, safe with. Right. But writing and then also exposing the, my own writing, I guess it really has to do with me having been trained before before my coming out as a writer as someone reciting poetry of other poets. And I like this right. about all three of us because we, when we sat on the boat at least, talking about mm -hmm. what we like and where how we come into writing, we all were able to name idols right. <laughs> in writing. Yeah. yeah, we're not alone. And um, that is really something um, I find rare. There are so many young poets. Who are disconnected. Who are disconnected and who just say, no, I have no real interest in who was before me. I'm inventing the wheel, you know. <laughs> it's like, no. <laughs> Marie, do you feel, when you're reading, do you feel like you're invading the audience's territory or time or... Well, I had uh, this feeling when uh, I, at the beginning when I was uh, a young poet, and uh, it was yeah I, I was feeling uh, awful because uh, yeah it, it was like you know being uh, very an exhibition so I'm mean, not exhibition mm -hmm. in the French mm -hmm. meaning, uh, but then I realized that people have their own autonomy and they are free and they are yeah. they are adults. They can and leave. They can leave. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, and uh, I like when someone leave and feel free to to do so, <laughs> and it's important you know to be uh, to have a nice uh, ch chair somewhere. I mean, I, I'm very. Yeah. Uh, it's important to me uh, that people are uh, well, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in good condition yes. because it can be so awful sometimes. Yeah. The yeah. uh, and then when, if you have a nice uh, seat and uh, maybe a, a glass, I mean, there is no reason to, you know, Not to, enjoy to, <laughs> to enjoy. And then if you don't like the poet, you can leave. So. But then how do the poems come to you? Or how the topics? Is it a day that you walk about and then all of a sudden there's a, oh, there's this one this one fragment that you need to pin down then and if you go on and walk away then it will actually disappear so you know i i we just joked about it but a lot of my writing is due to siri you know i say siri write this down you know mm -hmm. and then i don't have a pen with me siri <laughs> and um, how does it how does it come about is it then mm. a process of you typing it in, in front of your computer or Actually, it depends. I mean, my first book uh, was written mostly on my telephone, you know, in the subway, uh -huh. <laughs> because uh, I had not a lot of time, and it was I was in a doing a, some sort of awful uh, alimentary job, and I was so depressed. And I, when I was in the subway, which isn't a very cool place in uh, in Paris, but well, I was in the subway at some some point, and I was just it was just like a little act of resistance and writing my my stuff, and it's also 
uh, the reason why the book is uh, very fragmented and with a lot of orality inside mm -hmm. because it's also people entering the, the subway mm -hmm. and maybe Did you write together. down what people were saying? Yeah, actually I, I did, but it, uh, I was always changing a little bit, like, you know, I'm uh, stealing something, but I will change it a bit so that it will be really mine, and I don't know, but yeah, there is actually a lot. And, um, and yeah, and, and, and sometimes for some recent work, I, I, recent work, I was also uh, writing uh, within the reading, within the act of reading, and uh, I mean, it's also an act of resistance of uh, every day to be able to read on certain types mm -hmm. of books. And uh, uh, for instance, I was reading some books of uh, Jules Michelet, who is uh, known in France to be a, an historian, uh, and uh, he, he also wrote some very beautiful um, uh, uh, natural uh, science uh, books, and uh, like, were inside of which he wanted to, you know, uh, talk about nature to people and uh, try to, to make some literature with it. And it's also science and it's a very moving uh, approach. And uh, I was very fascinated with one of his texts, mm -hmm. uh, L'Insect. It's about insects and how insects are so important and like the people, uh, actually. And um, for instance, I, I wrote a long poem within the reading and I wanted to, to keep, you know, a book because when you read a book, then you forgot it a bit after the reading and I wanted to keep it. Mm. And uh, be writing a poem, a poem within the act of reading was also um, a, a sort of writing. I like that and I mm. can absolutely connect because that's also something I teach my writing students that if they have a writer's block and don't know how to start, they should go where people, in fact, speak um, uh, endlessly so either they, they are supposed to go to lectures at university or they mm -hmm. should go to readings of authors where they can just where they follow a professional reading because it often triggers something yes. else if or you maybe do to not, church or maybe to church yeah. yes mm -hmm. I never said that but um, in fact you could do that yeah? yeah but you have to stand up and you know do all these things as well mm -hmm. otherwise you're a bit rude sometimes so <laughs> yeah so well, in, in a lecture you can just that. dream about and, and uh, especially if you go to um, some some lecture on something you have never heard of before, like you know certain aspects of law. They're right. highly interesting yeah. and productive for writing. I think, yeah, um, no, very different language. May I ask you to uh, invade uh, <laughs> invade us again? No, I said something that <laughs> triggers this. Um, the second one was have forgotten. Well, I think we have like twenty more yes. minutes, so you ah, could you, so you could choose either because okay. I think we're going to have to skip one of the three poems you're reading. So okay. whichever you, you would like to. Um, Monster und Mädchen. I would read this one. Monster und Mädchen. Oh, yeah, I just read it and then maybe <laughs> talk about it. Monster und Mädchen. Ich bin das Mädchen. Bin das Mädchen. Das Mädchen bin ich. Dass du sortiertest, du sortiertest mich. Es blieb mir nichts, nichts blieb mir übrig, bin ich. Wer ich jetzt bin, ich jetzt bin, wer, fragst du mich? Ich war das Mädchen, war das Mädchen, das Mädchen war ich. Sortiert hast du mich, so spricht das Monster, das Monster bin ich. So this is a poem you requested? Yeah, um, yes, I, I'm very happy to, to listen to it in, in German because uh, there is this very s sound of the... the uh, monster, yeah, yeah. It, it works together. In, in French it doesn't, no? Maiden, maybe, or what is the, what is the Mädchen equivalent in la, French? La jeune fille. Hein? Yeah. But it's not the same. Yeah, mm. really? Isn't it it's, I mean, it is, but there is not exactly the... It's not, I mean, the sound, there is no a word like, it's jeune fille, it's not like... Well, <laughs> mm. but um, in, in this poem, I, I was very interested in the, the question of the, the subject or the... the e not the ego, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know, the, and how it's uh, like uh, trouble in the subject, something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's also like... A, uh, an equation and a uh, sort of crazy equation and how the subject is moving and uh, from a place to another and uh, it's also very vocal and um, I was just yes wondering um, how the because I, I listening to you I was thinking that yes the the, the connection with uh, the audience and the people is something very important to you and it's very less mm -hmm. a fleur de peau we mm -hmm. could say 
and uh, maybe this ish and this in between between in between between <laughs> monster mention and so on uh, it's is a way also to to describe uh, how we feel as a poet sometimes oh nice because of course monstrosity and um almost like this there there have been so many books lately on on feminist uh, the f or the feminist position and oftentimes these books are linked or have a chapter that deals with monstrosity mm. and the experience of the female as being somewhat of of a monster yeah in, like in, alien uh, yeah. yeah and aliens to me at least is more slender the monster to me really is godzilla you know yeah. stamping on something and walking and uh, tearing things apart and this strength that also holds, of course, great danger for everyone around her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Godzilla is also a girl in a way, right? She has babies and she has something to protect um, as a big lizard. <clears throat> um, and it makes it easier to, to uh, treat them badly if you make monsters. If it's a if monsters female, you yeah. think? Well, on the other hand, I think that... that this, this uh, idea is mentioned in so many feministic pieces of literature is actually the, the reawakening of, um, of feminine strength. Right. Or, okay. you know, I, I actually see it in, in the in opposite way. way. Right. This is a poem that starts my trilogy. This is the programmatic um, idea of um, the two antipodes, right? You have the, the big uh, destroyer and you have the whatever. I mean, it, it actually it should also say a bübchen, right? The German word for, me, for mating, but on the, on the, on the boy's um, side. So it, I wanted the delicate and I wanted the, the harsh and the destroying aspect. Um, because in fact, this is, was written after I overheard and was in fact told a story of, of um, a woman's abuse that went on for seven years in her childhood and puberty and her not being believed when she right. then opened herself and, and told it to someone. So a very sad Me Too story in a way before Me Too ever came up. And so um, she also uses very strange vocabulary. At least she hid some of her story in this weird word of the sortieren, mm -hmm. which is, um, is unusual when you, when you listen to it in a poem. It's, yeah. it's very obstructive also as a word within the poem. But that's what she used. And she said, um, this, this destroyer and this person, he, he resorted me. That was pretty much uh, her expression. And then due to her not being believed, she felt as if she was in, an, in a very strange and very faithful and, um, no, fate, yeah, fatal, so fatal entanglement with, the, with her oppressor with mm. that person so the because there was becomes, no exactly and that's was, what you were trying to talk about Marie it, right so there this, is the split this, subject or the, yeah, yeah. the subject kind of mm. yeah it's like confused. the mirror situation you see yourself in the mirror and then in a horror film you'd be pulled pulled into the mirror right mm. so this was kind of the idea and this is a very small poem in a way it just says I am the girl and then at the end I am also the monster because of course we all react to people who have suffered through something the same way we would, in, in fact, confront the monster who did it. People right. who have gone through horrible things, we, we keep our distance from them because mm. I really, I mean, of course, there are people helping and that's wonderful. On the other hand, a natural reaction is also to stay away because we feel we cannot make it better. There is, mm. Um, mm. There's a distance that just simply occurs as a, as a phenomenon of fate when something bad has happened to you. So, also without all this, this pre-knowledge and after-knowledge and around-knowledge, I, I hope this uh, makes this point of the strong and the, the, the weak, and yet also the weak evoking itself as, as also the strong. So, in a positive but also a negative sense. Monster is a very ambiguous word. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite word that is ambiguous to you, that you like to use in your poetry? Oh, that's a, I, I, I would have to think about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, I had, um, um, I'm always looking for the, maybe a, key, a set of key words in poets' um, work. And with some poets, I can make them out. And then I know that they, if they, for example, evoke a river, very basic example, then I know where from there on their thoughts will lead in the poem. Mm. And um, 
I feel very at home then. But of course, mm. they themselves may think, oh, I'm boring everyone with my old thoughts. And, and, and were you able to find uh, those words in Marie's? Uh, no, not yet. That's why I was ah, asking yeah. whether so she has So you would have a, to maybe uh, read more uh, yes. of it to, to, yeah. to find that. And I will just say something just after. Yes, of course. I, I, you, you found know, it. Yeah. The second one of Marie that I chose, or, or would you rather the, read the other one? Which yeah, one? you can choose. No, I can, I can read the, the next one. I mean, okay. It's like, the face that was mine. <coughs> Ce visage qui fut le mien, frotté très fort au mustella, contient la somme des visages collés. Et le gâteau d'un moment revient avec les récipients troués je les versais, je les versais. Tu t'improvises, m'invente une joie. Si ce courage est le mien et que tu serres ma main fort, la couleur s'approche de plusieurs reflets à la fois. Je forme avec la bouche le mot de quelque chose. Je me dé-remémore. Une trouée s'accentue. I love the femininity in this and the destruction of it as well. I'm sorry, but you wanted to say something, please. <laughs> no, I was just thinking about what you were saying just before about the, the leitmotifs mm -hmm. and the words, and uh, these poems, and uh, another one I will probably, probably read tomorrow, uh, have been translated, and I think beautifully, by a Dutch translator whose name is Rokus of Stender, and uh, we had a very interesting conversa conversation and email uh, by the email to discuss the translation. And I, I cannot speak Dutch, but he can speak French very well, so it was easy to communicate. And uh, he, at some point, he, he, to he told me that he was following some, some tracks and it was mostly like, yes, m motifs. Or, and uh, for instance, in the other poem, there is a clover and uh, the clover is like a key or a clue. Uh, for everything, and in, at the same time, it's just clever. I mean, it's just like well, a little um, vegetal, and uh, and uh, sometimes I like also the, the the clue to be like that, like something we don't really know what it is. And for instance, um, I know you have been working on Eraserhead, the film by David Lynch, and you mentioned it. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I did also, and that's some something something we can find in a, a lot of uh, Lynch movie is you know the clue is sometimes. So you know you don't know what it is, but it's like the you know the little uh, box, blue box in uh, Mulholland Drive. I think it's a bit. It can be abstract, but it's also just a, a blue box. And uh, maybe sometimes it's the the question around which the poem is turning and trying to find his way and cannot really find his way actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe it was a bit conf I don't no, know. No, I don't think so. Okay. It's, it's, it's looking for a different form of narrative, right? The yeah, same yeah, thing we were way, talking yeah. about before in your poem, mm. where we kind of figured out that you were talking about memories, and but also writing the way, or trying to come close to the way that a child's mind works. Mm. And that means you have to adjust the form of the poem. Mm. Yes, that's true that, I mean, the, our thoughts in our minds are very chaotic. I mean, it's a mess. Yes. And uh, we are trying to make sense of it. We're trying to, to give form to it. And it's sometimes difficult to even, you know, talk because it's a mess inside. <clears throat> and uh, maybe poetry is trying to not give all the mess, but just let feel, you know, that sort of uh, mobility um, behind the social surface and so on. And uh, <clears throat> it's true that it can create other kind of narratives and another form of narrations and uh, surprising ones, I think. Um, I mean, uh, that's what I feel when I read poets I like. And, um, <clears throat> well, Could I be a 13-year-old teenager, say 15-year-old maybe, and ask you to do a close reading of this the sentence, and the cake of a moment returns with its containers full of holes. Because I get the beginning, the face, I, I think, mm -hmm. you, know, so, you know, whoever knows what, what the poet knows, but um, <laughs> and the face that was mine rubbed hard with mustela contains the sum of the stuck on faces. Okay, I can, I can make an image of this and I realize, yeah, 
taking, you know, masking yourself, demasking yourself, so many faces. Okay, layers, layers, layers. Very nice. And the cake of a moment returns, I just don't get it. And the cake of a moment returns with its containers full of holes. <laughs> okay, but well, you know, it's like, you, we, are, we, were, we were speaking about monstrosity and mm -hmm. sometimes there are, you know, some glitch on the screen and it's something like that, like a mix between two very different images and the fact that maybe there, were, there was a cake at some point mm -hmm. and uh, also some um, like something. a physical cake. We're talking about something you could actually eat. <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> ah, okay. Because I was thinking of um, the the visagist who also has like, if if you oh, put on cake. makeup yeah, so right. so thickly, then people say, oh, it's cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it can be that also. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> The lynch box, here we go, okay, the blue box, okay, kick on my returns. I poured them out, I poured them out, the, the containers, yes. or the, hole, the holes, I, I loved it though, the idea of, I, um, I'm kind of full of holes. The container of the cake? No, it's not actually, it's a mix between two images, I mean, but I don't know if it's, I mean, I'm sorry, if I, no. probably it's not very clear. <laughs> And uh, it's not it's not really made to be it's more like you know um, like an impossible image like a monster okay mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes a monster can be uh, in the sounds sometimes in the image an impossible image and actually uh, this book is um, uh, not this one but the former book and maybe my poetry in general is uh, uh, working on the question of the unformal the, the, something you can give a, a form. And sometimes there are forms. I mean, the poem is always looking for its form and a sort mm -hmm. of a evidence, um, clarity, and so on. But sometimes it's, there is no form, and it's, it's a chaos. And, um, and uh, it's made to... I mean, it's, it's difficult to mm -hmm. make things uh, be, you know, illogical. Uh, I mean, when you do some, you know, cadavre ski, it always has a lot of meaning, actually. Mm -hmm. Meaning is always uh, the, the, the strongest one, I mean. And uh, the impossible is difficult, I think. And uh, sometimes I'm just trying to, to make something impossible in, 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 into a line. And it's a bit, you know, also prosaic and um, like, you know, there is a sort of irony in it, too. But... In, your, in the other poem which I chose, which unfortunately we do not have the time to read, um, um, Serving Her This Late Afternoon. We do have you put, seven more minutes. So. Okay, well, you, you do this beautifully because the end, the, the final lines, the final verses of this in, rewrite exactly what you just said. And that's why I really liked it because I figured this was the key to a lot of the work making... Yeah, Are you I okay know. with this, moving to that point? Absolutely. And then, and then we can this. talk about yes, it. Yes, I'd love that, because the end is... So it's the last in this poem in your selection. So Good. À la voir, je me suis dit, son œil est d'or et sa bouche un secret. On l'habilla d'une robe qui lui allait. On coiffa ses cheveux que j'avais coupés. Puis... L'enfant quitta sa cage et s'excusa d'un oubli. Je me promène sans doute dans cet oubli-là. J'entends sa voix quand je regarde par hasard du côté où elle se trouve. Parfois, je ris sans le savoir. Really? That was a ah. lot longer. Ah, ah oui, you want to... Uh, okay, I can't... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Really? Because uh, there is... A, okay. There is a bit some hair between, but I will... Uh... Par emboîtement léger, je me présente aux plusieurs étapes d'une jeunesse fictive. Le regard n'a pas de bras pour désigner ce qui arrive, dépend de beaucoup. Yeah. It's not this one? I'm not sure. Yeah, you see, I'm failing in French, so I have no idea if this is the poem I'm asking you to read. Ah, oui. Ah, si. Ah, not that bad in French. <laughs> I should have uh, seen okay, it. Okay, okay, I, I must... S sorry. No, but this is... You, it's you, the chaos of life. Do, so. you, do we have enough time for it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> well. À la voir en cette fin d'après-midi, la totalité, la voir... Elle s'est arrêtée devant l'inscription qu'il a donnée pour « super 
mémoriale, excellente. Dehors, la fumée d'un champignon improvise la fumée qui monte d'une étagère. Je ne peux dire si elle fut brève ou bien s'échappant d'un plan extrême de netteté. À la voir échapper, le mouvement fut. À la fois, c'est la nuit. Les pleurs se tiennent en équilibre au-dessus du drap vertical. Les cils battent la fumée à la recherche d'un conflit plus extérieur. Constante est un nombre incalculable de fois. Je ne dis pas qu'ils constatent la disparition, je dis qu'ils ne sont pas sûrs s'ils la voient. And these last lines, they can, and really, for me, they are exactly this. I am not saying they notice the disappearance, I'm saying they're not sure if they see it. I think that's absolutely genius. I think this is also a reason why, if I am so tortured, why I actually write. This, this vagueness and this, mm -hmm. um, this, this magical act. Maybe the impossibility all, almost of language. Yeah, and, f and knowing that you face Im impossibility because you write something and then it's going to be completely misunderstood by hundreds again. I mean, if hundreds read it. <laughs> and then, or if you then say it out loud. That's why I get so much into didactics because I'm just losing my mind over so many people misunderstanding me sometimes. Mm. Mm. Whereas I really try to be understandable. You know? <laughs> I would think so. But um, so weird. Now I actually pull the, the great magic of poetry down to the matters of is this understandable? And that, of course, is very unattractive. Yeah, that's very, yeah. That's But that's how, for example, yeah. I, as, and you are, as an editor, this is our job also to mm. take them very seriously if young poets approach us. Right, you do yeah. this as well. Definitely. That when they lay something in front of us and it's all airy and it doesn't make any sense, so to speak, and they have not gone through their sources and they, they employ a language that is not linked to anything. Mm. And not grounded. Yeah. Yes. yeah, sure, sure. And then you mm. can actually call them out on this is, you're just faking, you know, mm. this is, you really have to, at least, you know, you give them something to read, like Kurt Schwitters or something, if right. they really are too experimental yes. and it's all like, what? Um, then you at least tell them that this has already been done in a very accurate matter, in a way. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, Would you like to respond? Oh no! I'm sorry, I'm just. <laughs> I'm not even blabbering. sure if there's a, no, no, I'm, a question. I, I, I'm very. I, I think yeah, it's very important to yes for the the young uh, poets to to read a lot, of course, mm. Mm. and not only poetry and uh, everything actually and uh, and uh, yeah, self uh, sufficiency does not exist in poetry. We are readers uh, before everything else, and uh, I mean, um, I. I Yes, I. I We the, the more I, the more I uh, I write, the more I want to read, and uh, maybe sometime at some point I won't write anymore and just read. I guess we'll see. But I would be very happy beautiful. to to listen to your last poem if you can. Uh, yes, let's do that. <laughs> okay. And then we'll, I will end with And that. the last one. That's was uh, your vergessen. Hab vergessen oder Geister vergessen. Hab vergessen. Ah, uh, <coughs> the Alzheimer poem, so, <laughs> yeah, it's very, exact. Hab vergessen. Hab vergessen zu benennen, wie die Straßen, die Dinge, auf denen die Tassen, im Regal dort hinten in der Auffahrt, steh ich nackt. Die Haare offen trag ich deinen Ring. Kommt ein Mann täglich, wie ein, wie heißen die? Will mich Kindlein wiegen, streichelt über meine Wange, denke ich, Mörder, du Dieb, sie lassen sie das. Bitte weitermachen, unablässig. Rieche ich nach Arnika. Alte Frau, rufen sie mir zu. Ich frage sie, wen meint ihr damit? Stehe ich nackt in der Auffahrt? Thank you so much to the poets and giving us an insight into your process. Thank you.